Welcome back to the channel, guys. Nick Armenis here. In this guide, I wanna take you through the journeys I've personally seen for e-commerce stores going up to $1 million per month. So this is gonna be from the perspective of someone who runs a Google Ads agency and dealing with founders and marketers within these businesses. And I wanna to talk to you a bit about my perspective um, and I guess a bit of background. I'm also someone with like a lot of experience around product development, product research, sourcing, uh, and distribution with businesses in the multi-billions of dollars. So I'm not just someone that is just, you know, going, hey, this is the journey to million dollars per month. This is what I've seen with businesses I've worked with. So this isn't about clickbait or to show off. I just genuinely want to give you my perspective because a lot of people do ask me. Um, and these are what I deem as necessary to get to seven figures per month in an e-commerce business. While this is e-commerce specific, to be honest, most of these lessons carry across to any business, including agencies and other service-based businesses as well. I've been lucky enough to work with many e-commerce businesses and lots that went from really startups with either one or a handful of staff to now being international brands doing seven and even eight figure months with you know hundreds of staff. Some of these have been able to even crack multi-million dollar days on events like you know Black Friday, Boxing Day, um, and this is probably why most of these clients have stayed with me for years because I've been able to help them on that journey, particularly with their Google Ads. Now, I would never take credit for their business, but I, the small part that I played, I did well, and that's why they've been able to, I guess, or have wanted to stay with me for so long. My aim for you after watching this video is that you will also know what it takes to build or help build, if that's what you, the path you want to take, uh, build a multi-million dollar business. What I wanna take you through today is the things that all of these successful businesses had in common, the different phases that I've seen in e-commerce businesses, like what sort of common problems they've all shared, how they got through all these phases and hit the next milestones, and then like even just how they approach being stuck and how they got out of those phases. So let's get right into it. Um, what did all of these businesses have in common? All of these businesses had either highly desirable product, one, or ranges of product. Um, and it needs to be something that had like huge demand for, or, or it was something that was able to generate its own demand, like either through virality or it addressed a really big problem, things like that. But if the addressable market isn't big, it's very hard to hit these figures, particularly if you're in Australia where the market isn't that big. More niche things can do well in bigger economies within the EU and US and even the UK, but Australia is kind of small, so it does tend to be, you know, it needs to be a large problem to hit big numbers. So. These products also had to either solve a big problem. So this can be from a number of people's perspective or from a value. So if it was a very valuable, I guess, issue or problem in address, then the more likely, the higher chance that it could hit those larger numbers. Uh, or it was a huge improvement from what was already available in the market. Now this one is a bit harder because obviously you're then taking market share from someone else, but it is possible as well. Um, all, of the, all of these businesses were able to easily communicate them in their marketing of all the above things, right? So that they could solve a problem or they could communicate the virality or big need for the product very, very easily in marketing. The more difficult it is to communicate with a product, like some things tend to be types of products that you really need to show hands-on how they work. Like furniture can be hard online. It's getting better and better, especially with you know VR, AR, and lots of tools like that. But products and items that seem to need more, I guess, face-to-face -face interaction, the harder that is, the harder it is to hit those bigger numbers as well. Also, interestingly, particularly from a Google point of view, is most of these businesses sold more than one product. So none of these were one product stores that I have worked with that did really well. Now, there quite often is a really big bestseller in their range, and that drove a huge portion of their sales, but pretty much all of them had more than one product. I do find that the bigger the business gets, the only way for them to grow is to add complementary products, and particularly from a Google point of view, I've found that the more products, the better, as long as they're good products. Obviously, if they're bad products, they're not gonna do well, but if there was sort of something in the house, for example, that um, 
you wanted to change and then you would need to change everything else in the house to match it, that is a great business uh, that would do that. So whether it's furniture, bedding, things like that, when people want everything to match, they're good products because people will keep buying from you, average order values will be higher. So moving on to, we've covered off product, moving on to the operations and what uh, these founders all had in common, because this is probably more a founder um, based section. So most of these were all founder led for a huge portion of the journey. And most of the ones I deal with are still founder led. Um, some of them have decided to, you know, exit down the track and appoint managers, but a lot of them were for a good chunk founder led and who had a vision. Um, all of them executed very, very quickly. So whenever they had an idea, they went ahead. They obviously sat down and assessed, but they went ahead and did it very, very quickly. And all of them were quick at making decisions. Um, and if they weren't, if they had skill gaps down the track, they did plug them. So they did invest into their businesses. So they did all of them initially bootstrap, um, particularly their marketing. Everyone I've dealt with initially handled their own marketing. There's very, very few of these businesses that I've found that didn't do their own marketing at the start. Or or if they did, they had a partner who was good at marketing um, and eventually they reinvested any of the profits and outsourced into things, outsourced the things they weren't good at um, and even brought things in house. Um, they engaged consultants, agencies and field experts in whatever it was that they needed help in. So again, almost all of them reinvested all the profits for many, many years. That has been a key factor I've seen to success. And they all constantly tried to improve the products that they were selling. So they didn't just go, hey, this is the product, it's awesome. They all constantly improved it. Um, and that included all assets and all facets of the business, website, marketing, everything. They constantly improved things. The common phases I've seen that e-commerce businesses are, and if you do run one, you will probably know which one of these you fall into. So the first one is the idea phase. This phase is basically when, okay, you've brainstormed, you've seen a gap in the market or an opportunity. This is the phase where you bring everything together. You're probably not really making many sales. You're getting samples, you're creating products. You might be going over to China or other countries to source these products. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of this is like the ground foundational work where you establish the idea and then you move into the testing phase. And this is very marketing and people focus and feedback collection. So you wanna get feedback on the product. Obviously you would have done that in the idea phase as well. But in the testing phase is where you're really testing out, you know, ad creatives, marketing channels and things like that. Um, and once you move into the next phase, I call this the early wins phase where you start to see a little bit of potential. And this is when you start getting a little bit of money coming in through the door and then you're reinvesting that back into your marketing. You're making some product improvements along the way. You're making some website improvements, but you're really reinvesting. And then you're getting into this phase that I see a lot of businesses come to me either in the early wins or in the growth phase. A few come into later phases, but for the most part, these are the phases I deal in. Um, and in the growth phase, this is when things are just going nuts. Like people love your product, ads are working phenomenally, cash is coming in through the door, expenses do start to tick up though. Um, and in the growth phase, this is where you really start to need to engage some experts to help you, um, you know, make sure costs don't get out of control, make sure that your marketing is getting your best bang for buck um, and all of these things. So you eventually move into this phase that I call the consolidation phase. And this is where you bring everything that you're doing and you kind of reassess it, improve it. Um, it also is where you know growth has probably hit its maximum potential and then you're introducing either new products or new strategies to get a bit more growth again. Um, and once you get through that, I call this the profit phase where you really start, you know, rather than growing, you're probably growing a little bit each year, you know, maybe a few percentages, five, 10% maybe more, but you're not growing crazy. You're not growing 100, 200, 300% a year. You're starting to focus more on profit and pulling some money out of the business. This is when you start to actually make some money. Um, and then after this, you know, you probably are working towards outsourcing a lot of the senior management tasks to potentially eventually either totally exit operationally or totally exit from a, you are no longer the owner of the business. This is kind of the phases I've seen. Now, all, all businesses will kind of spend different amounts of time within these phases. There's no set amount of time. I've seen people go from phase one to phase, you know, the what, seven phases I went through in a few years. Some can go through, some take 10 years, a decade or more to get to those phases. Um, but realistically, 
you'll all pass through some of these phases. You may even skip some potentially, but everyone kind of passes along this path is what I've seen. And, and this is moving on to our next section, which is what are the common problems I see all of them face? And these can happen at different points in time, but the number one problem I've seen e-commerce businesses face, and this is a lot from an ad point of view, but across the board is cash flow. The number one reason I've seen stores either pause, stop, you know, go bust is because cash flow hasn't been managed well. You know, as you grow, you're gonna need more money to buy stock, to buy products, to invest in staff. So the bigger you get, the harder it actually becomes to manage your cash flow. You might think it becomes easy, it actually becomes harder and that's when you need things like cash flow loans or uh, lines of credit, uh, you know, big credit cards to be able to kick expenses down the road as much as you can while cash comes in. There's lots of things you can do to improve it, but obviously the best thing you can do is have a really good accountant um, and someone that can assist you with that. But that's the biggest thing that you're gonna encounter. And the next issue I always see that's an issue is obviously advertising issues, particularly as you scale through these bigger numbers, your return on ad spend does tend to drop. Um, and then sometimes it just becomes very, very hard to replicate your initial success. And that's when you probably need experts to assist or you know rethink your strategy. Um, and, and really, again, cash flow is probably gonna be an issue with the advertising. If your sales slow down, you're not gonna have money to pay for your ads. If your ads slow down, you're not gonna have money coming in to pay for anything. So it's, it, it does become hard to manage, and that's where expense management of fixed costs and um, all your costs in general, so your fixed and your variable costs becomes very, very important to manage those. So the next one is forecasting stock requirements and keeping up with demand. I see a lot of people have issues with that. So obviously because the bigger you get, um, you know, you don't really know how many you're gonna sell and some people often surprise themselves how many they need and they don't order enough stock in time to cover that and then it becomes an issue because they've got all these people wanting to buy and then competitors start to pop up if you're not quick enough and then they take some of that demand away from you. So the quicker you can, I guess, cement yourself as the market leader, you know, sometimes you're gonna have to take a risk but you, you obviously want to forecast uh, what stock you will need. It's often hard, but the longer you do it, the better you'll get and the more you'll understand how many units of things you will need. It also comes back to, you know, the more you grow, the more stock you need to buy. So it's an issue. From here, we get systems and operations. You know, they, they all come under strain, whether it be customer service, HR, and uh, any sort of system in-house, as much as you can, sort of streamline it, have SOPs in place, find a way to automate it um, as best you can. So logistics is another big one. So inventory management, similar to forecasting. So inventory management in locations becomes important. Um, order processing fulfillment kind of in systems and operations, shipping and production issues, all of these will become really, really big things for you. And then customer expectations, like over time, these customers expect more and more and more, and it's very, very hard to manage that the bigger and bigger you get. So particularly from a reputation point of view. So as you can see, guys, e-commerce success may seem random at times, but as you've, I've just kind of showed you, there's a lot of common factors between the stores I've seen and I'm sure ones that you've seen success with. Um, you know, it doesn't happen overnight. They go through all of these things that you just don't see. And I hope you find it useful, and especially those of you that are growing an e-commerce business. I know at times it can be hard, it can be daunting, but you can do this. Just focus on the phase you're in and how to get through it. If you have hit a plateau in scaling your e-commerce business, please reach out on the link below that I'm gonna leave and see if we potentially may be able to work together. But if not, I will see you in the next video. Thank you very much for watching, guys.